Good morning. Welcome on this Lord's Day, this Transfiguration Sunday. Very pleased that you are here. My name is Phil Summer. I am the interim pastor of the First Presbyterian Church in Winchester, and glad that we can all be in this holy space together this day. At the end of the pew, you will find the uh, Ritual of Friendship uh, uh, pads. We ask that you sign in and check any appropriate boxes. Anything you put on there, I testify to the fact we read them in the office. So if you, anything you want us to know, put the note there, then pass it along so that those sitting with you might also uh, be able to use it. And while you're doing that particular uh, uh, piece of business, let me um, uh, make some announcements for you. Uh, this Wednesday is March the 1st, and it is Ash Wednesday, the beginning of our Lenten season for this year, and we will be here in the sanctuary at 7 o'clock uh, for Ashes and Holy Communion, and we invite you to come and to be a part of that. Uh, please note that our uh, disaster response donations are uh, needed as our team is getting ready to leave this coming weekend. Uh, the first weekend in March to head south to Baton Rouge, and they need uh, donations for construction supplies. If you are so no uh, moved, please note that. And um, the Highland Food Pantry received a gift of 600 eggs. Well, that's wonderful. It's a mar 600 dozen. Sorry, thank you. 600 dozen. The problem is there aren't enough egg cartons to hand them out. So if you've got any empty egg cartons, bring them. We, uh, we need them. And please keep in mind in terms of prayers this week and in your thoughts, uh, Amanda Simmons on the death of her grandmother, uh, Glenna Denault, and the family of Thelma Bond, to Karen, uh, to Karen Anderson and her family upon the death of her mother, Shirley Pierce, and Amber Fry and uh, on the death of her mother, Linda K. Fry. We do have birth congratulations to Jonathan uh, and Taylor Motiska uh, and for their daughter, uh, uh, Marley Quinn. So please pay attention to them as well. Are there any other announcements we need to make one to the other today? Well, we do have two minutes for mission. I'm sure they're only going to be a minute anyway. But Tara, you're on for, um, uh, for our Lenten discipline of heading for Jerusalem. Good morning. Good morning. So with Lent here, we are doing Walk to Jerusalem again. A lot of you are probably familiar with that, but that's when we take the time not only to prepare our minds and our hearts for the resurrection of Jesus, but also to prepare our bodies. It's a great time in spring, get our bodies moving, enjoy this little early spring that has sprung and kind of ran away. But how we do this is we are trying to achieve as a congregation 5,933 miles, which is what it takes to get from Winchester to Jerusalem. And Chris also wanted me to add that if you wanted to go the extra 649 miles, we could get to Kuwait. So <laughs> keep that in mind. Um, but how you earn miles is there are two different ways. One is with physical activity, and it could be any physical activity, sports uh, practice after school, games, exercise with like group classes, yoga, golf, anything that gets your body moving. If you can do it in miles, calculate your miles. If it's not something that generates miles, just go by time. 15 minutes is a mile. You can also do devotional reading, and there are a couple ways. Dan has a Facebook group that we're reading uh, a book together for a Lenten study, and there's also uh, on the bulletin board right outside Sanctuary a, uh, an online self-led devotional you can do, and 15 minutes of devotional time is also equal to a mile. You can text me, you can email me, you can grab me in the hallway, um, or you can fill out slips of paper on the bulletin board and write your name and your miles, and I will calculate them for you. Um, and uh, we'll see if we can get there. In the past, we have gotten there and back again, so um, it, we've got some big shoes to fill. Thanks. Thank you, Tara. And now uh, Giovanna has an announcement about First Fridays. Good morning. Good morning. It's that time again. The First Friday recital series is back for its second concert this coming Friday, March 3rd at 6 p.m. The recital will feature the senior class of Shenandoah Conservatory's musical theater department. If you went to see Guys and Dolls this weekend, you've heard some of them already, including Lindy Hockaday, who's up there, uh, who is here today to entice us with her beautiful voice. Uh, 
There will be a free will offering at the door. Please join us on March 3rd at 6 p.m. for a fun evening of song. Thanks, Lindy and Rick. Come to your prize with deserts from the dark as of your radiance. By the blood I may alter your brightness, set us free by the truth of your loveness. Shine on me, shine on me. Please join me in the responsive call to worship. The Holy One is our Sovereign. Let us sing God's praise.
Let us join in the responsive call to confession, followed by unison prayer of confession and then a time of silence for personal confession. Trusting in God's steadfast love, let us pray together. God of compassion, in Jesus Christ you reveal the light of your glory, but we turn away. Distracted by our own plans, we confess that we speak when we should listen and act when we should wait. Forgive our aimless enthusiasms. Grant us wisdom to live in your light and to follow in the way of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen and amen. The good news of our faith is this. If we call upon God, we will be answered and forgiven. That promise gives us peace and joy. Let us share that peace and joy with one another. invites you to be seated. Today we're recognizing parents and children of third graders who have taken part in our Biblical Brains program. I invite those children and their parents to come on down uh, now to receive uh, the gift of your Bible. I also invite all other children to come forward to the front to witness this important milestone of faith for our, three, uh, for our third graders. And Mr. Todd will uh, explain all of this to us. So all of our children, come on down, and especially those who are receiving Bibles. If you're a sibling, you can stand with your sibling, or you can, any other kids, like we said, you can come up and have a front row seat if you'd like. Um, to see our presentation of Bibles. So during the past um, several weeks, um, these eight children and three others, so a total of 11 third graders, have worked hard to learn important things about the Bible and to improve their skills in learning how to use and read the Bible. So parents have been encouraged to share in conversations together on their own, which expand this experience and create an opportunity to open the Bible as a family in their homes. As a church, we promise to support parents in their efforts to raise children in faith-filled homes. And today, our church family has the opportunity to share a gift of the Bibles to these third graders in partnership with their parents. These children have prepared for this important milestone, and today it gives us joy to present them as a gift. Parents, in Christian love, you bring your children to this day of recognition and blessing. Children, today you take another step in your journey of faith. May God's blessing of these holy scriptures be a lamp to your feet and a light to your path. We will present um, Bibles to parents, and then in just a moment they will present the Bible to their children. Amen.
So parents, as you place the Holy Scripture into your child's hands, you will say these words, today we give you this blessing, the Bible. Today we give this blessing, the Bible. Receive the word of God, learn its stories, and study its word. Its stories belong to all of us, and these words speak to all of us. They tell us who we are. They tell us that we belong to one another, and we are the people of God. Thank you all for doing this, and, and you all have done a great job. In your bulletin, you have a unison prayer. Let us pray together. Blessed be your, your name, name, O Lord, Lord our God. God. You, you are, are the, the fount and source of every, every blessing. blessing. Encourage, Encourage each, each of us, us with, with the help of the Holy Spirit, Spirit to use the Bible for our prayer and inspiration, for the increase of our faith and devotion, and for the building up of your kingdom. Through your words, may we be transformed into the very likeness of Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you forever and ever. Amen. We thank you all. Congratulations. And it's time if you can go back and sit down, or if you want to go to We One's Worship, now is the time. And for the rest of us, God gives us all kinds of gifts. One of the greatest is the gift of God's peace. We invite you to stand and to greet one another and to exchange God's peace one with the other. As we come to hear God's word, I invite you to be in prayer with me. We love your stories, Lord. We love them all. We know them by heart. And each time they make us feel warm and good. But we ask that today, for this particular familiar story, that you will give us pause, that you will open the windows of our hearts and our minds and of our spirits, that we might hear afresh your word that you wish us to find. We do ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I commend unto you the lectionary readings that you do find uh, listed in your bulletin, and I am sharing with you this morning uh, the from St. Matthew's Gospel in the 17th chapter. And we've spent the past, what, three, four weeks uh, dealing with the Sermon on the Mount, but we jump ahead because uh, the Sunday before Lent begins, uh, we always recognize and remember the transfiguration. And so we are in the 17th chapter beginning at verse one. And I am sharing with you uh, the interpretation, uh, the translation that is entitled The Message. Um, if you want to understand how some uh, uh, different translations uh, are similar and yet sometimes a little different, get out your pew Bible and go to uh, uh, Matthew 17. Let us listen for God's word. 
Six days later, three of them saw that glory. Jesus took Peter and the brothers, James and John, and led them up a high mountain. His appearance changed from the inside out right before their eyes. Sunlight poured from his face. His clothes were filled with light. Then they realized that Moses and Elijah were also there in deep conversation with him. Peter broke in, Master, this is a great moment. What would you think if I build three memorials here on the mountain, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah? And while he was going on like this, babbling, a light, radiant cloud enveloped them and sounding from the depth of the cloud a voice, this is my son, marked by my love, focus of my delight, listen to him. When the disciples heard it, they fell flat on their faces, scared to death. But Jesus came over and touched them. Don't be afraid. And when they opened their eyes and looked around, all they saw was Jesus, only Jesus. Coming down the mountain, Jesus swore them to secrecy. Don't breathe a word of what you've seen. After the Son of Man is raised from the dead, you are free to talk. The disciples, meanwhile, were asking questions. Why do the religion scholars say that Elijah has to come first? And Jesus answered, Elijah does come and get everything ready. And I'm telling you, Elijah has already come, but they didn't know him when they saw him. They treated him like dirt, the same way they were about to treat the Son of Man. That's when the disciples realized that all along he had been talking about John, the baptizer. At the bottom of the mountain, they were met by a crowd of waiting people. And as they approached, a man came out of the crowd, fell to his knees begging, Master, have mercy on my son. He goes out of his mind and suffers terribly, falling into seizures. Frequently he is pitched into the fire, other times into the river. I brought him to your disciples, but they could do nothing for him. Jesus said, what a generation. No sense of God. No focus to your lives. How many times do I have to go over these things? How much longer do I have to put up with this? Bring the boy here. He ordered the afflicting demon out, and it was out, gone. And from that moment on, the boy was well. Here ends the reading of this portion of God's good and holy word. May we truly understand it in our hearts and our minds. Praise be to God for God's word to us. One aside, um, you know, of course, that the only thing that pastors can do all on their own is pick hymns. Well, we always pick them by lyrics. So uh, uh, the second hymn, it's a great hymn. But you know, you may have to work at it a little bit because I don't think you've ever sung it before. So just <laughs> hang in there with it. Just remember when we get there. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It was Christmas vacation. I was 15 years old, and we were off from school those few days right before Christmas Eve and indeed Christmas Day itself. And it had snowed. And all the streets in the part of New Jersey where I uh, lived were all covered. They had been plowed, but they were covered. But the sidewalk still had not been shoveled. And yet I made my way carrying a beautifully wrapped, by myself, of course, uh, present that I had carefully uh, picked out something I knew would be cherished by my 15-year-old girlfriend as I took her this Christmas present. And of course, uh, uh, gave it to her. And then I was on my way home, but it was just terribly, terribly cold. The kind of cold when it's so dark, and yet you can still see your breath coming out of your mouth with each breath that you do take, that kind of cold. And yet I still had the warmth of my 15-year-old uh, 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 teenage love going on uh, there with me to keep, get me home. And I was about halfway there and walking down the center of this neighborhood uh, street, and all of a sudden, I looked up, and it was a clear, beautiful night. 
and there was nothing but black sky, and it was full of countless stars. And all of a sudden, the reality of God was there present for me. How I had gotten to that point through Sunday school and receiving Bibles and going to youth group and church camp and all of those kinds of things, who knows? But at that moment, God was real to me. I was standing there on this snowy neighborhood road in Allwood, New Jersey, on holy ground. Jesus speaks to us, or Matthew speaks to us about the transfiguration. Jesus takes the kind of inner circle, Peter, James, and John of the uh, disciples, and goes up on the mountain probably for meditation and prayer and to be away from the crowds uh, that uh, still continued uh, to gather around him and to come to him and to make all kinds of demands. And so they go up there, and as our translation says, his appearance changed from within. That's a significant understanding. Jesus changed from within, and there was this light in his face and about his clothes. You know, not the kind of, of transformation that happens that we know in terms of theaters. You know, when you're sitting in the audience and, and what they can do, the magic they can do with lights and with uh, sound and all kinds of things uh, that come on. That's a kind of a manufactured thing. But this came from within in terms of Jesus. And all of a sudden, the disciples recognize the fact that uh, here on this holy ground was not just Jesus in, in this, this brilliant state, but they also saw Moses. Moses, the lawgiver. Moses, the one that was there, the one, and we know about the story of coming uh, out of Egypt and how they go into the wilderness and Moses goes up on the mountain, spends 40 days and 40 nights and there surrounded by God in a cloud, is given the Ten Commandments and he comes back down and what does he find? He finds that the people are restless and they were wondering about all of this and whether he was coming back or not and they had built, they had built a golden calf. And so God puts this punishment upon them and Moses has to go back up and receive the, the, uh, what we know as the Ten Commandments. But it's not just there in terms of Exodus where we find it. We also find it in the third book of Moses in Leviticus in the 19th chapter, a much more expanded understanding about God's law. Indeed, sharing this part with you as Moses speaks it to the people. When you harvest your land, don't harvest right up to the edges of your field or gather the gleanings from the harvest. Don't strip your vineyard bare or go back and pick up the fallen grapes. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am God. You're God. And there's all kinds of other instructions there. And then it comes again in, in uh, chapter 19 at verse 33. When a foreigner lives with you in your land, don't take advantage of him. Treat the foreigner the same as a native. Love him like one of your own. Remember that you were once foreigners in Egypt. I am God, your God. Keep all my decrees and all my laws. And so the law of Moses that Jesus learned at Mary's knee, as did all Hebrew boys and girls, and then what did we hear in the terms of the Sermon on the Mount? We heard Jesus says, I have not come to put aside the law, but to fulfill it. And he speaks to us about how to do that. And we pay attention, indeed, Jesus and Moses, but also Elijah. Elijah the Tishbite, the one who came out of the wilderness with leather loincloth and coat of hair, who came to speak to the king and to his queen Jezebel, who had erected uh, altars and temples to the, to the god Baal and had the people worshiping them. And Elijah comes and confronts them all, indeed. And God takes care of all of the priests of Baal. But Jezebel is so upset with all of this that she wants 
Elijah's life and in peril he runs away. Yet God takes care of him and feeds him in the wilderness, leads him up ah, to a mountain and there in a cave. And God calls forth Elijah to come and to stand in the mouth of the cave. And we are told that there was earthquake, wind, and fire, but God was in none of those. Indeed, as Elijah stood at the mouth of the cave, he heard a still, small voice that spoke to him, that gave him instruction about how to be God's prophet, how to speak justice to the people. Jesus, Moses, Elijah, all of these things on holy ground. And so it is, I would submit for you and me and all of us, it has to do with heart and head and soul, with all of the things that we have learned, all of the things that we have cherished. We have just finished this season of epiphanies, indeed, and why not? I won't sing to you today because uh, I'm not very good at singing Old Holy Night, but it came back to me. That particular verse kept hitting me uh, every day this past week. I looked it up in a hymn book, but it's not there, but I've got it anyway. It was in my head. Long lay the world in sin and error pining. Now, we know about that. That speaks to us in terms of that lyric. We know about a world that is like that till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. Aha, holy ground to angels who come to dirt poor shepherds who are working out in the field and in the cold. And they too are scared and the angel says, don't be afraid, for we bring you good news of great joy. When the angels go away, they said, we have to go and see this. And they go to Bethlehem and they find Mary and Joseph and the babe. Indeed, and they return rejoicing. Or maybe it's the star and of the three scholars or the scholars who bring their three gifts uh, there. Or maybe it's Jesus coming to his cousin John at the Jordan to be baptized. And the voice coming out of heaven saying, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. Or perhaps the teachings on the Sermon on the Mount as Jesus fulfills the law and explains to us what it is about in terms of our lives. Or maybe it's to Peter who was able to say at Caesarea Philippi uh, in, in Matthew right there before uh, the transfiguration, uh, they are all together with the disciples and Jesus says, who's the people see that I am? And they name all kinds of folks. Well, I think you're Elijah. They think you're Moses. I think you're this one or that one. And Peter without being prompted or perhaps even understanding what are you saying, that you are the Christ. You are the Son of God. Indeed. And then, of course, there is Peter here on the Mount of Transfiguration. What is his response? What's he say? Wow, what a great thing has happened. Let's build three monuments. Can I do that, Lord? I'll build one for Moses and one for Elijah and one for you. Boy, does he sound like a Presbyterian, doesn't he? going to build that bricks and mortar and those temples and those things that speak of our faith and of things that we know but that stay there that somehow sometimes contain this spirit and this living God but at other times perhaps may seem a little hollow and the radiant cloud comes and surrounds them and who knows it says a voice is it a voice Maybe it's not a voice. Maybe it's an understanding. Maybe it's just one of those aha moments, that holy ground in which it's understood, this is my son, marked by my love, focus of my delight. Listen to him. So where have your holy grounds been? When have been your moments in which you've said, yes? Was it with a particular pastor maybe? in a Bible study or a sermon or in a prayer group. Maybe it was with a youth leader, the one who came and didn't treat you like a, a, like a, a youth or a teenager, but saw you as a human being. And there was a one-in-one -one, uh, connection there and honored you for who you were as a young person. Maybe it was at camp, church camp, 
a very, very important place for some of us in terms of the things that we discovered and learned. Or maybe, maybe it was a death of a loved one. I will never, ever forget the two years I spent back, oh, I don't know, in the 1990s, in which within those 24 months, I lost eight people who were dear to me. Entire generation and then some. And yet through all of that mourning and all of that loss and all of that difficulty, God was present and walked every step of the way with me. When was it? Maybe it was just a string of events that just kind of happened and you don't understand it and you don't even know why, but it was an aha moment for you. But then the disciples, frightened by this holy moment, have Jesus come and touch them. And all of a sudden it's just Jesus. Just Jesus standing there with him. And they start coming down the mountain, and Jesus warns them. He says, don't tell people about this. They aren't going to understand it. And they aren't going to understand it until the resurrection. Well, guess what? We're resurrection people. You know, we're the ones afterward. We're the ones that can tell and talk about this or certainly live it and show it. And then they enter into this conversation. It's kind of like, uh, like we do when you go to Bible study, and all of a sudden it's there in Scripture, and they're talking about Elijah. Well, the religious scholars say that Elijah has to come first, and when's that going to happen, and how come, and what's going on? And Jesus says, Elijah has already come. And they did not recognize him. Indeed, he had come, and they treated him like dirt. Be careful. You've got to know and understand your holy ground and when it is there for you. At the bottom of the mountain, back in the real world, the crowds are there and the crowds are waiting and a man bursts out of the crowd and he falls on his knees before Jesus and he says, you've got to heal my son. You've got to heal my son. He throws himself into the fire. He goes into the river. He's going to be hurt. He's going to kill himself. So what kind of seizures are these? Is it epilepsy? What is it? Who knows? We don't know. And Jesus is upset. Or he says, your disciples could not, could not heal him. And Jesus wonders, why not? We've been about all this teaching. We've been about all this learning about being God's people here in the world. What is it? that we are missing. And he says, bring the boy here. And he casts out the demon. And from that moment on, the boy is well. There in the crowd on the ground. Look at the front of your bulletin. You got a picture of that. Take a look at that. That is holy ground. And so here we are in terms of the chaos of the world. Red states, blue states, purple states, Refugees, strangers, separation, fear, not knowing what's going on. Ah, and how about transitions in churches? You think in terms of being unsettled and wondering what's going on, and yet here it is. Dan sent a thing to uh, Marin and I, and bas it, basically the, uh, the message was and the piece that he found, it was it's, it's in the doing. It's in the doing. It's not about the talking. It's in the doing. Those of us who have had a glimpse of the glory of God cannot stay away from sharing it. And those of us who have stood on holy ground and been transformed, who have been taught the law of love and heard the prophet's call for justice, it is our turn. It's our job. It's where God wants us. And the editor of the Presbyterian Outlook in addressing this said this this past week. And we are to respond boldly, publicly, in ways that bring the possibility of transformative healing. Please tell me that you've witnessed those responses in your own life. And she goes on to say, I know I have. I have been in an airport waiting to board a plane when a group of strangers helped entertain a cranky toddler so that her exhausted mother could rest. I saw a teenager hand over the $20 she was going to use for a movie ticket and popcorn to an elderly man who asked if she had any change to spare. I have seen a strange families rally, show up, come together when illness or death makes all of those schisms and arguments among them pointless. 
I have heard of truck drivers making a way through traffic so that a bereaved family won't miss their loved one's funeral. I have known congregations who have cooked, cleaned, built, advocated, kept vigil, prayed, protested for friends and strangers alike. All of these are glimpses of the shining face of Jesus. Haven't you been an eyewitness to this majesty of God also? Claim your holy ground and know that it exists where we live. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Be seated, please. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have promised to hear when we pray in the name of your Son. It is in this confidence and this trust that we offer our prayers this morning. We pray for your church here in Winchester, your church in Ethiopia, your church in Guatemala, your church in Bangladesh. O oh God, enliven your church for its mission that we may be the earth's salt and the world's light. Breathe your fresh life into us and give us power to reveal Christ in what we say, to reveal Christ in what we do. 
We pray for the world. You are the creator of all. Lead us and every people into ways of justice and of peace. May we respect one another in freedom and in truth. We pray for our community. God of truth, inspire with your wisdom those whose decisions affect the lives of others, that all may act with integrity and with courage. Give grace to all whose lives are linked with ours. We lift before you the president of our nation, Donald Trump, the members of our Congress, the governor of our commonwealth, Terry McAuliffe, the justices of our courts. And this day, O oh Lord, we pray for neighbors in need. God of hope, comfort, and restore all who suffer in body or mind or spirit. the immigrant and the refugee, the homeless and the hungry. The addicted and the alcoholic. May they know the power of your healing love. Make us willing agents of your compassion. Strengthen us as we extend your compassion, which makes people whole. Lord, you have called each and every one of us to serve you. Grant that we may do so with your love in our hearts, your truth in our minds, your strength in our wills, until at the end of our journey we know the joy of our homecoming and the welcome of your embrace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in the temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hear these words of the psalmist who declares, the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. With gladness, let us now present the offering of our life and our labor to the Lord.
Let us pray. Blessed are you, God of all creation. It is through your goodness that we have these gifts to share. Accept and use us and our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Amen. You are God's gifted, motivated, blessed people. Go out into the world and show him to everyone you meet. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.